from Jerusalem, Israel. Our speaker for this evening's program is Rabbi Hanani Weitzman. It is a, at his own request, an emergency podcast about the situation at Yeshiva University. Uh, this is Lowell Joseph Gallen, founder of the Root and Branch Association Limited, established in New York State and God of Israel Bless America in 1981, and now celebrating our 40th anniversary, 1981 till 2021, 40 years young. We welcome our viewers and listeners worldwide and our live Zoom studio audience to today's episode in our Root and Branch Association Limited English Language Conference and Lecture Series established in Jerusalem, Israel in January 1995, and now celebrating the conclusion of our first quarter century, 1995 to 2020, hosted with deep thanks at the OU Israel Center, 22 Karen Hayasad Street in Jerusalem, and now starting our second quarter century, now on Zoom, we are 26 years young. We are broadcasting from the land of Israel, city of God, Jerusalem, Hill of the Priests, Givat Hanania, Abu Tur, overlooking Mount Moriah, where we of traditional Israelite Jewish faith believe that the third and final Israelite Temple of Jerusalem will soon be under reconstruction and stand forever, as per the prophet Ezekiel. Please see the biblical book of Ezekiel, chapters 40 through 48. Today is Thursday, September 2nd. 2021 in the Gregorian calendar. It is the, well, now that it's the evening, it is the 26th day of the sixth Hebrew Israelite month, commonly known as Elul, of the last days of 5781, the sixth year of our seven Shemitah sabbatical year cycle, Rosh Hashanah, the new year for the creation of the world is next Monday evening, 5782, the Shemitah sabbatical year. Hopefully, we will see wonders and miracles. Well, we already are, uh, but let's hope that more and more people are able to see them and they'll become more explicit as we go along. So now I will hand over the program to our host and speaker, Rabbi Hanania Weitzman, who will gladly take questions and comments from those who are in the Zoom session. Please post them to the chat. Hanania, it's all Yours, let me unmute you and let me remove myself from the spotlight. Thank you very much, Lowell, uh, especially for setting up a seminar two, two, two days in a row on short notice, taking the time to do this. And also for all those who are listening, there are a lot of people uh, talking, a lot of videos that you can watch, and we're all overwhelmed with things to read and watch these days. So I very much appreciate people who are dedicating that time to hearing what I have to say, and I hope I'll make it worth, worth your time. Uh, I generally don't like to talk about myself. That's not the reason why I do these things or to tell personal stories, even though I have a lot of really interesting stories to tell that are very good lessons. I share them on an as needed basis. And tonight I'm going to share some personal stories about my history because it ties in to the ultimate point that I want to make in this session. And I really dedicated a great deal of thought to how I can best make this point for everybody. So I want to start off with why I went to YU in the first place. This is going back many years already. I'm 43 years old. So it's going back almost a quarter century from when I first attended YU. Uh, at that point in my life, I felt I needed to go to college. And YU was the only college that I even applied to, not because of any academic considerations or Jewish considerations per se, or Hashkafic considerations, but simply because that's where I felt it was the easiest place for me to be a Jew, to go to college and to be a Jew, to have a, to have a minion all the time, to be able to learn Torah, to, you know, to not worry about the Yamim Tovim and making up classes and work and things like that. That's really the reason why I went to YU. It's just easy to be Jewish there. Um, I was never a sheer person. Now in YU, uh, as everybody here probably knows, the way the system works is you have a sheer in the morning, you have a learning program in the morning, and then in the afternoon, you have your college classes. You cannot attend YU without signing up for a sheer. You can't even sign up for the college classes. I assume it's the same today as it was back then without first signing up for a shear. They have many different options, many different programs. So most people have a, have a fairly easy time finding, finding a track, finding a, finding a Rebbe that works for them. Now, I personally was never a shear person. This is going back to my youngest days. I never enjoyed sitting in a, in a shear and hearing a person talk. There are very few people 
that I can hear, you know, that I can listen to for a long period of time and stay focused. It's not a learning disability. It's just, I find most classes to be very boring. Either they're too fast or they're too slow, or it's just not in interesting to me. I had this problem when I was learning in Israel. And I had this problem when I attended YU. I did not know which year I would be able to settle into. So the first year that I signed up for was Rabbi Shechter's shear. I didn't know him very well. I heard him speak on one or two occasions previously. He was a big name, a big Talmud Chacham. So I signed up for Rabbi Shechter's shear. I attended his shear for a grand total of three days. Nothing against Rabbi Shechter. It just was not enjoyable to me. He taught a lot of Torah. It was very interesting, but it wasn't my style. So I left after three days and I never came back. During the rest of the first semester at YU, I bounced around from shear to shear. I never officially transferred shiurim. I tried out this year. I tried out that year, sometimes for a day or two days or three days. The longest I tried any one shear that first semester was Rabbi Goldvich's shear, Pile Ployam. I lasted there for two weeks. It's an inside joke if you've ever heard Rabbi Goldvich speak. Very nice, very good. I have a lot of respect for him. But after two weeks, I, did not, I didn't want to attend the shear anymore. So after that, uh, most of the first semester was already finished. I decided I was going to learn on my own every single day, which is what I had been doing previously in Israel as well. I got into trouble for doing that because when you attend a yesh, yesh, yeshiva, they expect you to be a cookie cutter, fit in, do what everybody else is doing and stick with the program. If you're a very serious student and you're learning well and you're growing and you're accomplishing, but you're not fitting in with the program and the expectations of the program, they have a real problem with that. They'll have a bigger problem with that than if you're doing drugs and alcohol and doing all kinds of things. If you're not fitting in with the program, they have a real problem with that. Um, so at the end of the first semester, I, I got an F for Shear. Rabbi Schechter gave me an, an F because he didn't even know who I was. I, you know, I had a zero attendance basically. So I have an F on my transcript. After that, I had no intention of going to a shear. I was learning very well. I felt I was growing in my learning. I was capable of learning by, by uh, my, 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 uh, self. So I didn't want to continue going to a shear. Now, again, as I mentioned earlier, you can't sign up for college classes at YU if you don't sign up for a shear. Whether you go to the shear or not, whether you do well in the shear is a separate story, but you have to at least sign up for the shear. Well, for the next two years, the next four se se semesters, I did not sign up for a shear. Now, that is not possible. There were a series of miracles that happened every single semester where I had to sign up for classes, just very strange series of events where the end re result was that I signed up for college classes, but somehow or other, I did not sign up for a shear. My college transcript from YU, again, has an F from Rabbi Schechter for the first semester. The next four semesters for the shear, it says N-A, not available. There's no shear, there's no grade, it's just N-A. They have no record of me. What was I doing? I was learning every day. I was going to a base medrash, not the main base medrash. I was sometimes learning in a small Sephardi base medrash because it was quiet there. Eventually, I settled into the fifth floor of the library, and I learned there every day. I was learning very well, but YU has no record of what I was doing during that time. Just as evidence that I was, in fact, learning well during that time, I published a Sefer during those years. I published two books uh, during my years at YU, my first two books. The first one was a series of short stories, science fiction stories, and the second book was a collection of my own Divrei Torah, many of which I had written during those years when I was not in a, in a shear. So this leads into the next, next thing. Um, when, YU is very PR oriented, as most schools and institutions are. They care about PR and they, and they care about money. So when a student publishes a book, that's a great PR opportunity. So the first book that I published was a science fiction book, and YU, in fact, was very proud of that. They, they, they put out a PR statement about it. They put out a little picture of the book, a little interview. It was very nice. Several years later, I think it was my senior year, and that was my first year in graduate school. I was, I was on the campus for six years total. I think that's when I published my Sefer. Why you didn't do anything for PR, they didn't market it in any way, it didn't seem to make a blip on their radar, which is kind of odd. You would think if a student is publishing a Sefer of the very Torah and it actually had a has, has, Haskama from Rabbi Moshe Tendler, whose shear I very much later on started to attend already in my graduate school and Smicha years, he gave me a has, 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 Haskama for the Sefer, so it's real Torah, but why you never made a, a big deal out of it, which is kind of strange. When I published the Sefer, I wanted people to buy it, of course. I wasn't doing it for money. In fact, I didn't make money off the Sefer. I, I was selling it essentially at cost. So I, I photocopied one of the Divrei Torah and I put it up on bulletin boards around campus. So people would see the, the, the Dvar Torah, hopefully they would like it and they would wanna buy the, the Sefer. So uh, I noticed that shortly after I put up this photocopy of one of the Divrei Torah, it was being taken down. Students were taking down the Dvar Torah. And something very funny happened. Thursday nights at YU, at least when I was there, they had a Musser schmooze, one of the, uh, 
Rashi Yeshiva, they would have a different one every week. We'd give a Musr Shmuz, Jewish ethics uh, in the main base Medrash. I didn't go, I had no use for them or their Musr even back then. Uh, but students came over to me one Thursday night and they said, were you at the Musr Shmuz? Did you hear what they said? No, I have no idea what you're talking about. What's going on? So they said, well, he didn't mention your name, whoever this rabbi was who was speaking that week, but everybody knew he was talking about you. What was he saying? Well, in, my, in, in the Dvar Torah that I had posted, it was just something on a parsha, and I quoted Rashi's shot of a certain Pasuk, and then I offered my own shot that I thought was closer to the Iker shot, the primary shot. I wasn't necessarily arguing with Rashi. I certainly wasn't putting Rashi down. I have the highest of respect for Rashi. There isn't one day of my life that goes by when I'm not learning Rashi. I couldn't get heads or tails with my learning without Rashi. So I have the utmost respect for him. But nevertheless, uh, Rashi's mission in his Pirush on Chomish, generally speaking, was to give you the Iker Pshat. And I thought on one particular Pasuk, I had something that was closer to the Iker Pshat, which I offered in my Dvar Torah. So this, so this Rosh Hashiva was absolutely furious that some no-name student would dare to argue with Rashi, to challenge Rashi, what chutzpah that is, who do you think you are, arguing with Rashi, on and on and on. And everybody knew that he was talking about me. All well and good. So my response was, well, again, I wasn't denigrating Rashi in any way. And I'm sure that if I was at Rashi's Shabbos table and he was giving his pirush on that Pusik as his Dvar Torah at the Shabbos table, and I, raised my, and I raised my hand and I said, excuse me, Rashi, what do you think about this? Maybe this is closer to the Iker Pshat. I don't think Rashi would have been offended. I don't think he would have slammed down his Becher and thrown me out of his house and said, how dare you challenge me? Rashi would have listened with interest. Maybe he would have agreed with me. Maybe he would have not agreed with me. Maybe we would have gone back and forth. I think Rashi wouldn't have had any problem with me, you know, sharing my own thoughts about the shot of the Pasuk. But this Rosh Yeshiva, super duper from, how dare you say anything about Rashi? I bring this up again because when you have a student who's publishing Divrei Torah, it wasn't apikarsus, it wasn't anything, you know, outside the pale. It was just Torah thoughts. You would think that the general attitude of the students of YU, the Rashi Yeshiva of YU, and the people who run YU would be a little more positive towards that. So this leads us to the next point of what YU is really about. It's about PR. Like I said before, one of the big things, the big news stories at the time when I attended YU was that they, for the first time, had achieved a ranking with the US News and World Re Re Report annual ranking of top 50 colleges in the US. YU had finally cracked the top 50, and that was an enormous, enormous source of pride for YU. And from that point on, every single time the US News and World Report came out with their ranking, YU would beat its chest that they had risen in the rankings, and all the, all the different scores that they were getting. It was a big source of pride for YU that the US News and World Report thought that they were a good college. Again, it has nothing to do with the Torah studies, all about various, uh, you know, various categories with which they rank the, the non-Jewish classes. But that, that was the big yichus for YU, not necessarily the Torah that was being studied and taught, but that the US News and World Report, a Goyish media source, thinks that YU is a good college. The Jews in America had made it. The Goyim thought that the Jews were good. That was always the source of pride. Uh, there was one semester that uh, I had a very serious problem signing up for classes. It wasn't because of my not signing up for a shear, but it was because I, I took out student loans, as most people do, which, by the way, I think is a terrible idea in retrospect. You should never go into debt uh, to you know, get a high-priced education, which is, in most cases, not going to pay for itself anyway. It's really a bad deal. You're just basically paying for a piece of pay paper. But be that as it was, uh, my federal student loans uh, I, as, I, as I was about to sign up for classes, I was informed that I would not be allowed onto the campus for approximately two weeks. Why? Because the federal student loan money, for some reason, due to some glitch, had not yet come in. And they, why you accepted, they totally acknowledged that this was not my fault. The money was guaranteed to come in. There was some sort of a glitch that it was in the process of being sorted out. The money was going to come in. But until that money hit YU's bank account, then I would not be allowed on campus. Now, this is, of course, devastating for a student to miss the first two or three weeks of a semester. How are you going to catch up? It's a big problem. So fortunately, somebody was able to pull some strings for me, and they let me in in their great graciousness. They allowed me in. Again, YU is not uh, begging for money, but because the few thousand dollars of my, of my student loans were going to be a couple of weeks late, they were ready to just kick me to the curb. And if that affected my entire life beyond that point, so be it. So that's money in PR. Uh, one of the other big stories when I was a student there was they were in, inviting a, a non-Jewish poet, Maya Angelou, who I'd never heard of before, but apparently she's a very prominent poet. From what I understand, she happens to be an anti-Semite. She has a lot of, uh, basically, she's not a Jewish role model. 
But that was a very, very big source of pride to the time. And in fact, the student newspaper, the commentator, which I actually wrote for, that was uh, one of the starts I got as, as a writer. I had a column back then for the student newspaper, was uh, not so much in favor of it, of why you're making a big deal out of this you know, non-Jewish poet with really anti-Jewish beliefs uh, coming to speak on campus. Of course, she was paid handsomely for the, for the privilege of sharing her poetry with the YU students. Uh, I don't recall too many times in why you invited a Jewish personality, a Torah personality that was as, as great a source of pride as this Maya Angelou coming and speaking on the campus. But there was an even more prominent guest to the campus, a paid guest that came when I was a student there, Bibi, Benjamin Net Net Netanyahu. This was after his very first term as prime minister, which was most noted for giving away Hebron to the Arabs. The Arabs, of course, were never able to conquer a city in Israel from the Jews. So the, uh, so the government of Israel made it easier for them to just give away the land instead because they couldn't take it by force. So Bibi gave away Hebron, the heartland of the Jewish people, to the Arabs. And after that, he, he, was, he was knocked out of the government. He didn't win in the next elections. And at that time in his career, he was a nobody. He had no power. He was a former prime minister who was out of the government. And he was hoping at some future point to get back in the government. So why you at that point in his career hosted him for a speech and they gave him the Lamport Auditorium, which was the largest and most prestigious place on campus for a speaker. And it was like standing room only. It was hard to get in. I, I got there early. I had a seat. I came mainly just because I wanted to hear what people were being told. I had no covote for BB. Again, even back then, I wasn't a stupid kid. But again, a prominent person is coming on campus. It's kind of exciting. Let's, let's, let's see what all the fuss is about. So I went and I heard him speak. And it was basically a campaign speech over and over and over again. Peace with, peace with security, peace with security over and over again. That was his mantra that he kept on repeating. Basically, he gave a glorified campaign speech. I'm told that he was paid $50,000 to speak to give this campaign speech, which nobody, uh, it's not, not this is, wasn't Churchill, okay? This was not something that we really need to, uh, it, this speech is not going down the annals of history as a speech worth $50,000. Uh, but every time he said something that was like pro-Israel, I'll keep Israel safe, that sort of thing, he got a standing ovation from hundreds and hundreds of people in the room, including the Russia y y y y yeshiva, many of whom were dragged in to hear him speak and were sitting up on the dais. And every time there was a round of applause, if you've ever heard him speak at the UN, it's like every four seconds, he's got to stop for applause. There was a massive round of applause, standing ovation. I am proud to say that my butt didn't leave the seat one time during the whole speech. I will not clap for a man who is not a Torah Jew who gave away Hebron to the Arabs. I will not cheer him. I will not clap for him. And I will not go rah, rah because he's giving a campaign speech. But every other person in that room stand up, was standing up and wildly applauding because this probably an atheist who gave away Hebron was nevertheless a very famous person, most likely the most famous person that they will ever share a, a room with. And because some of that fame is sort of rubbing off on them, I was in the same room as Bibi, I heard him talk. Maybe I even had the opportunity to shake his hand. That is a big yichus. Why you, and in that part of the Jewish world, I think really most of the Jewish world, they, they, they crave money, power, yichus, kavod, being close to power, being close to famous people. They, they wanna get these photo ops, they wanna get their picture taken with a famous person. So whether the rabbis were standing and uh, cheering for Bibi because they were told to, or whether they really felt that this is a covered person, you got to stand up for him. I don't know, but I thought that was a great source of shame that the spiritual leaders of YU are standing up and cheering for a man who is not a from Jew, is not a Torah Jew, and gave away Hebron to the Arabs. So that, that sent a strong message to me at the time. And of course, Bibi was simply grooming himself for his future job as a chief marketing agent at Pfizer. And at the same time, he had a side job as the acting prime minister of, of Israel. So that's the person that they were cheering for. And again, I'm very proud to say that I did not cheer him even once. So you get a, just a little bit of the, of the culture at YU, people who are, who, are, who are students at YU longer back, YU always had scandals, they always had con controversies, but this is just some of the things that I experienced and sort of raised red flags in my mind that something's wrong with the culture at YU. YU is calling itself a yeshiva and a university, but it seems to be a sec secular college first that does have Torah classes. It seems like they favor the non-spiritual, non-Torah aspects of the YU ex ex experience more than anything else. That the, the Torah is always taking a back seat. The Torah is cheering for Bibi as opposed to Bibi bowing down to the, to the rabbis and bowing down to the Torah, which is the way it should be. So let's, let's move on out to what people were taught at YU while I was there. So I took a philosophy class while I was there. My first year at YU, I wasn't sure what I wanted to do. I always loved working with children. Eventually, I figured out that I wanted to be a teacher. My main goal when I was a student at YU was to try to, 
uh, gear my learning towards being able eventually to move to Israel and find a job. I wanted to move to Israel and settle here as soon as possible. So I tried out different things and uh, eventually I settled on being a teacher, which you know, I, didn't, I never found a teaching job in Israel. I taught as a volunteer. I still teach to this day, but only as a volunteer. I did teach in the States. I was a classroom teacher for years. So the first semester when I was just kind of taking a wide range of classes, trying to figure out where I would find my place, I took a philosophy class. This was not Jewish philosophy. This was regular college American philosophy. And I remember the teacher there dressed all in black like Steve Jobs. And uh, his message, I, I remember one, one message that he emphasized over and over again, how do you know that if you fall out of a window or you jump out of a window that you will go down instead of up? Just because every time somebody stepped out of a window, they went down, how does that prove that the next time you'll also go down? Maybe there's some variable or something will change and you'll actually go up next time. How do you know, right? How do you know that you are who you think you are and the world that you think you're living in really exists? Maybe you're just a brain floating in a science lab that's being stim 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 stimulated to, to imagine and dream that you're living this existence, but you're not living this existence. How do you know, right? Prove it. Where is the evidence? Isn't that something that we hear all the time today? Prove it. How do you know? Where is the evidence? So that was essentially the point of this philosophy class. How do you know you can't know anything, which is, of course, kafira, it's atheism. I know it because God said so. I know it because the Torah says so. There are things that you can know. There are facts. There are things that are black and white. Not everything is just an opinion. Not everything is just a narrative or something that we speculate. There are facts and there is fiction. There is truth. There is false falsehood. And we are supposed to know. Judaism is not a faith-based religion. It is a knowledge-based religion. We know that Hashem exists. The Torah says that we have, we have a mitzvah, the yodato hayom. You should know today that I exist, not to believe that I exist. And the Goyim and the non the, the, the non from Jews have a real problem with this. How do you know? Prove to me that God exists, right? We know God has proven himself to us. God determines what constitutes evidence. And we know that God exists. If you don't know that God exists, but you only believe that God exists, you have a problem that you need to work on. But that was what they were teaching at YU, actual kafira how that fits at a yeshiva, I don't know. A class like that does not belong there. But that, of course, is the, is the style of what is so-called modern orthodoxy. I never identified with modern orthodoxy or any label. I've written a lot of articles against these labels. These labels only serve to categorize Jews, fit them into little boxes where Jews in this box can't talk to or marry Jews in a different kind of box. And it's not to our benefit. It's only, it's only to our harm that we have all these different labels and categories. But YU calls itself the flagship of modern orthodoxy. And in fact, many people who take after that philosophy, which can't even define itself, they're always struggling. What is modern orthodoxy? Is it moving to the right? Is it moving to the left? Is it in the center? What's the future of it? They're always grappling with what is modern orthodoxy? And what's the future of modern orthodoxy? It's like a schizophrenic uh, relationship that they have with this label. But the Jews who identify with that, and they like the schi schizophrenia of identifying as modern orthodoxy. They, they grapple with it. They think it makes them smarter and more in, in, enlightened to grapple with this crisis of what is modern orthodoxy. They tend to gravitate to this type of kfira-ish thinking of how do you know things? You can't prove anything. You can't be too confident in your Judaism and you can't be too proud in your Judaism. You have to make a, a tortuous in, 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 intellectual exercise out of everything. And that's not necessarily what Torah is. Of course, Torah is very deep, but it's not this torturous process of how do you ever know anything? We are supposed to learn. We are supposed to know what we learn and to be able to form strong conclusions based on what we learn, not always be grappling with how do you know this and how do you know that? One of the most dis disturbing uh, teachings that I was exposed to when I was at YU came from the Rosh Yeshiva as well. I wrote about this long, long ago when I was a student at YU at the end of my senior year and starting my first year of graduate school and smicha, and I'll get into the story of that, why I even entered smicha, which was not part of my plans. Uh, I have a very strange life, but it makes more sense as time goes on. Uh, they, they, I was very attuned to the orthodox dating world. Those who know me for a long time and know my writing know that this was my biggest passion for many, many years. I wrote two books on the subject, many, many articles. I started a grassroots campaign called End the Madness, which was, the purpose of it was to bring true Torah values and sanity back to the Shidduch world, which is still a big mess. I still write about it occasionally, but not so much anymore because I feel like I've pretty much said everything that I have to say on the subject. So one of the things that really galvanized me to start End the Madness was a series of lectures on dating from Rosh Yeshiva. Again, this was on Thursday nights, if, 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 I, if I remember correctly. And for a period of weeks, every week they had a different, uh, a different Rav giving a lecture on dating. And I never identified the names of the people who said 
some very shocking things. I'm going to identify them now. Uh, Rav Schechter one time gave a lecture and I was standing in the back of the room, not because I wanted his dating advice, but simply because I wanted to hear what other people were being told. Because I knew that what people were being told that was gonna become the law for them and many marriages were gonna be made or broken based on what he had to say that night. Uh, one of the things that he said that really sticks out in my mind was if you are dating a girl and you meet the mother and the, the following are his exact words, and she is a fat slob who watches television all day. That is an exact quote that I remember to this day. That is what the girl will be like in 20 years. Not, you may have an indication from the parents, you know, how they raise the child and, you know, the apple might not fall far from the tree. That is what the mother, that is what the, the girl will be like in 20 years. If the mother is a fat slob who watches television all day, that's what the girl will be. And of course, the students chuckled and laughed. Ha ha, he said, fat slob, oh, it's so funny. And they were furiously taking notes and the tape recorders were whirring back in the day when you didn't record everything with cell phones but with tape recorders. And there wasn't a peep of protest. There wasn't a hand raised to question him. This was the law. And I wondered to myself, my blood was boiling. And I wondered to myself, how many people in this room right now are going to break up with the girl that they're dating with who they otherwise really should marry based on what he just said. They're gonna meet the mother. The mother is not gonna be such an impressive person you know, maybe doesn't meet that standard. And they're going to say, well, if this is what the mother is today, this is what the girl's going to be like in 20 years, I'm out. And how many marriages were going to be broken because of that? How many, how many marriages it should have been would not be because of that. Another thing that Rabbi Schechter said was if you're dating, if you have the opportunity to date, to date two girls who are exactly the same, which is of course ridiculous because no two people are exactly like, but there's one difference between them. One of them comes from a from family and one of them is a balas chuba. So he said, you should date the girl who comes from the from family and not the balas tshuva. Why? Because when it comes to the yamim tovim, you want to be able to spend the yamim tovim at your in-laws. So if you date a girl who comes from the from family, you can spend the yamim tovim by her family. And if she's a balas tshuva, then you can't. So as a practical matter of convenience, don't date the balas tshuva. Now, again, we're starting off with the premise that two people could be equal, which is, of course, very silly. But even assuming that you have a really difficult choice between two people, that should not be a criteria for saying yes or no to somebody, especially because as I've written and people have noted many times that if you look at the, the, the founding fathers and mothers of the Jewish people, they were essentially all Bali Tshuva. They came from families of idolaters and they broke away from those roots and they became close to Hashem. And they are, again, the founding, uh, the, the patriarchs and the matriarchs of the Jewish people. And many of our greatest people in history come from families that are not necessarily so religious. Every person has free choice. And in fact, if a person has the strength of character to break away from bad roots and to, and to transform themselves into something so much better, that is really incredible. Bale Chuva are, are unbelievable people that they're able to change. How many people are able to change their minds today about anything? And you have Bale Chuva that are changing their whole identity, their whole lifestyle. And they're doing it not for money. They're not doing it for convenience. Many of them are giving up uh, close friendships or losing their jobs or they're having you know, stress with their own families to do this. They're doing it because they want to get close to Hashem. That is an unbelievable sacrifice for people to make and it should be lauded, should be praised and those people should be treated like absolute gold. But Rabbi Shechter said, no, you won't be able to spend the Yom and Tobin with the family with, with the families. Again, I wonder how many people were Xing off the girl that they could have dated because of that. Rabbi Willig gave a shear also, which I attended. And again, my blood was boiling. And one of the things that he said that stands out in my mind, and he made a big joke out of it, and everybody was laughing, that you see these guys, that they're, they're good Torah students, they're learning in the base medrash, when it comes to night seder at 10 o'clock at night, you see them in the hallways, and they're sitting and having long conversations with the girl that they're dating, on and on and on, these long conversations. It's bitul Torah, why do they have to talk to the girl for so long? Let them have shorter conversations and spend more time in the base medrash. Now, uh, if you are courting a girl for marriage, we're not talking about people that are just stom flirting and having a good time. We're talking about people that are seriously dating somebody that they plan on quite possibly marrying. Those long conversations are essential. You have to spend a long time talking to somebody to get to know them before you, you decide that you're going to try to build a home and a family with them. That's not Pitto Torah. So when I heard this, I said, I've got to do something about this. So I started End the Madness. And the first event that I ran was at YU. I had Rabbi Tendler speak. I had two other people speak as well. And my purpose at the time, my main purpose in starting in the madness was to sort of counter this un-Jewish propaganda that people were being told about dating. And, and I, I had Rabbi Tendler speak and the, the audio file of that first event, which was very largely attended, is still on my website, endthemadness.org. It just basically just archives at this point, but the audio file is there. Everybody should listen to it. And he asked me, 
you know, the other speakers were not well-known people. They weren't from YU. We said, why don't you have other Rashi Yeshiva? And without mentioning names, I told them because I don't want to give them a platform to speak. I already heard what they said about dating and, and I don't want them to talk about dating anymore. That was what I said. So that was, those were some of the things that people were being taught by very prominent names in YU at the time. Now, why do I bring this up? I bring this up because when we fast forward today, more than 20 years later, uh, the, you see that the, the culture of what YU is, the values of YU, the, the types of things that people are being taught really ties into what's happening today. Now, today, I didn't talk about my smicha yet. Let me, let me just talk a little bit about that because it's really a, a very important part of the story. I never intended to be a rabbi. When I figured out that I wanted to be a teacher, I wanted to be a teacher and I still identify as a teacher, not so much as a rabbi. Now, after two years of not even signing up for a shear, as I mentioned, uh, eventually they, they caught up with me. And now it only happened because of my final semester at YU, it's a very strange story, um, I needed somebody to sign a, a paper that I was now able to register for college classes. And he asked me what shear I was signing up for, sort of like casually. And I was not going to lie. All right. I, I, I could have said, oh, I was thinking about this year or that year. I would have had to, to tell him a lie before he signed the paper. And I was not prepared to do that. So I said, well, honestly, I haven't been attending a shear. I've been doing my own thing. It's working out very well. And I'd like to continue doing that. So he said, I, I, you know, I, I cannot sign this paper in good conscience because you have to sign up for a shear and it's problematic what you do. He wasn't angry at me, he wasn't nasty, but he said, I can't in good conscience allow this. You know, I, can't, I can't sign this paper and allow you to sign up for classes without signing for a shear. He said, you gotta speak to the Dean of the Jewish Studies Program. So I had to turn myself in and I said, well, you know, hi there. I haven't been attending shear for the last two years but I published the Safer and I've been learning every day and I'm a good guy, I'm a nice person. Would you please allow me to continue this for one more semester? They were not happy. They were not happy at all. And they wanted to throw me out of YU my last semester. They wanted to throw me out. They were not impressed with the Safer. They said, very nice you wrote a Safer, but this is not part of the, the again, this is not the way the y Yeshiva functions. You got to sign up with the Shear. You got to kind of do what the other people are doing and fit in with the general framework of the y Yeshiva. Even if you're a good guy and you're learning Torah and you're serious, if you don't fit in with the framework, we can't have you here. Now, I stood my ground. I was not intimidated by authority even back then. I had other run-ins with authority in my life even before then. So I kind of uh, de de developed a thicker skin. I was very confident and even uh, I had a lot of chutzpah at that meeting as well with this dean. Uh, and I met with him a couple of times. And finally, something extremely, extremely strange happened, which again, makes no sense. He said, I'll give you, give you a choice. You have two choices. Either you can find uh, another place to go for your final semester or you can join a shear for your last semester. And to make up for the fact that you haven't been going to a shear until now, after that, join the smicha program. Very strange. That's a very strange offer to make. Either we kick you out or you join the smicha program. Well, okay. Well, I already decided I wanted to be a teacher. Having smicha could be convenient for that. You know, it's easier to get a job. You'll probably get a better job. You'll get paid a little bit more. All right. I mean, I didn't, well, I had no interest in smicha per se, but it seemed like it was convenient. Fair enough. So I stayed on at YU. My last semester, I joined the shear of Rav Aaron Salavechik, who was a true god. Though that was the last semester that he gave a shear at YU. He was already very old and very sick. It was following his strokes. And at the time, he wasn't even giving the shear anymore. He actually, uh, he, he came to the shear, but one of his Kolel students gave the shear. He listened. And when he had something to add to the shear, he would add something to the shear. That was the last uh, semester that he was even present on campus. And I didn't learn very much from that year, but I did enjoy at least being in the presence of a Godal, even though he didn't speak very much. It is, it is just as a side point that there's one memory that I have that stands out from that. The Kolo student taught something. I don't re remember what it was, and it's not really important, but Rav Salavechik, who, uh, again, I don't think people took him very seriously anymore because he couldn't talk very much. He wasn't giving a shear. He was a very old you know, man, not very good health, who was basically just sitting there. So people didn't take him very seriously, but his godless, his greatness was still very much, very much there. So Rosalovich spoke up and he uh, gave a c c correction to the student. It's something that he'd heard was not correct and he corrected the student. And the student was very surprised. His Kolo student says, are you sure? And he said emphatically, positive. He said that a couple of times, positively sure. And he corrected the student and that was that. So he was still very lucid, very with it. And he had all this tar, but physically speaking, like Rav Chaim today, he was a Godol, but he was not physically capable of teaching a shir at that time, but his greatness was still there. Anyway, back, back to the main point. So I, I floated through that last semester at YU. I passed this year just by attending. It was really just a pass fail thing. I attended that. And then I attended Smicha YU. I learned very, very little that was relevant to me as a classroom teacher, which is all I wanted to be. 
I had a difficult time in smicha. Wasn't I had to go to shiurim again, which wasn't my thing. I made it through smicha and I got the title. I have the piece of paper on the wall behind me today, which in retrospect is very valuable. And I'll say something openly. I mean, people, I don't know who's going to hear this all over the world, but you really see Hashem's handiwork in this very strange experience that I had at YU, where I had to choose between being kicked out or getting smicha. And I never wanted smicha. I never really cared for the smicha. I barely got the smicha. But the smicha now is very important because I am the only uh, American Anglo rabbi in Israel who is speaking up about the vaccines and everything that's going on today. And I think the fact that I have that title is very, very important to people. They, when they hear, hear that somebody's a rabbi, and it is important if somebody has the title of a rabbi, especially if they really earned it and they worked hard to get it, then it, it does mean something. The title of a rabbi today doesn't mean what it's meant to mean, doesn't mean what it used to mean. Today, women are rabbis and gay people are rabbis and non-Jewish people call themselves rabbis. All kinds of crazy people call themselves rabbis. So unfortunately, the title doesn't mean as much as it used to be. The same as the title doctor really doesn't mean as much as it used to be. But be that as it may, the fact that I am an Anglo rabbi in Israel and speaking out about this, I think carries the messages that I say a lot farther than they ever would have gone otherwise. People view me differently, rightly or wrongly. I don't think they should. I'm just a person. I'm just a teacher. But I have that title, a rabbi. It, it, it means something to people. And again, I never wanted it. I never intended to get it. And it's only by an extremely strange series of circumstances that I got the title of rabbi. And I really believe it was meant for this time. Okay, so getting back to why you, who calls the shots? Okay, one of the other things that happened after I'd already left campus was it came out that in the Bernie Madoff scandal, YU lost a tremendous amount of money. There was money that was donated to YU for student endowments and scholarships that instead of being used for their intended purpose was given to Madoff to play and lose in the stock market. Now, if I gave Stucca or I donated money to a religious institution, specifically if I earmarked it for student scholarships, I would not want them to parlay that money in the stock market. If I wanted to try to make that money grow, I could keep it myself and put it in the stock market. I'm not giving it to them to make the money grow, even if they think that they can make more money and do more for the students. That's not why I gave it to them. I gave it to them for a purpose and that they're not using it for that. So that, that to me, nobody really talked about that angle of it. They always talked about, oh, why you lost a lot of money and a lot of shuls and other Jewish institutions lost a lot of money in the Madoff scandal. But I never saw anybody raising the point, why was that money given to Madoff in the first place? Were these private funds? Were these funds that were given to the institutions and whoever donated them stipulated that you can invest this money if you wish? I don't have a problem with that. If that's the case, fine. They were authorized to do that. But I strongly suspect, again, I don't have proof, but I strongly suspect that many of the people who donated funds that were eventually given to Madoff they did not authorize the money to be used for this purpose. They didn't intend for the money to be used for this purpose. And that money was flushed down the toilet instead of being used for what it should have been. And it tells you something about the culture of Jewish institutions, not just YU. I'm picking on YU because I happened to be on the campus for six years, so I saw a lot of things. But this goes on all over the place. Why are they giving money for stuff that is given for Tzedakah to be parlayed in the stock market? Now, Riv, 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 has a blog. She, she's, she's been doing a lot of research on this. Her blog is rivkalevy.com, R-A-V-K-A-L-E-V-Y.com. She's done a lot of research on YU and vaccine-related matters and other things. She's done a tremendous amount of research on, on, on the uh, murder of Jews at May, May uh, Rhone and many other topics. I don't always agree with her conclusions, but she's a very well thought out person and does great research. So she wrote a series of articles about the dirty money at YU, the history of YU, how all of the biggest donors to YU get their money, you know, selling, sell, working for Israel to sell weapons to, uh, to other countries that are used to kill, you know, innocent people fighting dirty wars scandalous money, money coming from essentially gangsters. Why are these gangsters giving millions and millions and millions of dollars to YU of all places? Why are they buying Sifrei Torah for YU? Are they doing tshuva? Is there a little Jewish spark in them that they feel guilty and they want to do something good for the money? Maybe, possibly, but nevertheless, it's sort of an eye opener when you see that really most of the money that YU gets is not from its former students. The former students don't donate money to YU. The money's coming essentially from people that are very far from the Torah and Jewish values. Conflicts of interest all over the place. They, they have chairs that they give to the Russia yeshiva. They have all kinds of awards. They give them money. So the question is, who's really calling the shots, right? When, when YU comes out with a policy that every student must be vaccinated unless they have a doctor's note or a re religious exemption. By the way, side note, I've been writing re religious exemptions using that very uh, con 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 convenient smicha to write exemptions for parents of students that they want, they want their kids to go to YU. First, the first thing I say is, 
if you need a religious exemption to attend a religious in, in, institution, maybe you should think twice. Maybe that institution does not really promote your re, re, religious values. But be it as it may, say, if you really want the exemption, I'll write it for you. So now you need a re, religious exemption as a student to attend YU. Most people are not going to bother with it. They're just going to you know, get the shot because essentially that's what they're being forced to do. They're, they're wearing masks now. Now, where did this edict come from? So YU, of course, has a psaq. Rabbi Schechter publicly wrote a very strange psaq in the Jewish press. It's not really a psaq, it's Purim Torah. It's a bunch of nonsense. Uh, and I wrote a great detail about it. Rabbi Schechter, again, is the most prominent posek, the most prominent rabbi at YU. Did Rabbi Schechter really sit and study everything and determine as an honest conclusion, every student needs to get the vaccine? Or was he given marching orders from the uh, people who run YU, who live in multi-million dollar mansions, who have six-figure salaries over $700,000, many of these people, they live in a totally different world. They are connected to very rich and powerful people who, again, are very distant from Jewish values, where people like Rabbi Schechter and other prominent uh, rabbis at YU, given their marching orders, we want all the students, we want all the students and faculty to take the vaccine. You make it work. You, you find a way to stup it into the Torah and figure it out. I suspect that it's the latter and not the former. OK, again, who's really calling the shots? It's the people who have the money. And again, I don't have bank transfers. I don't have leaked videos. I can't, quote unquote, prove it. I don't have evidence. But if, if, if a person's breath smells terribly of garlic, he probably ate the garlic, even if you didn't see him eat it. Well, if something smells like it really stinks and it's got terrible, dirty money and the corruption all, all involved, there probably was corruption. I can't prove it. I can't prove it in a court of law. Maybe it will happen. Maybe it won't. But if it's just again and again, dirty money, corruption, strange things happening, it stinks. If something really stinks, it's probably because it stinks and there's something wrong with it, which really gives in to the, to the con conclusion of all this, that my opinion of YU, and it's not just YU, but many of the so-called modern Orthodox institutions and even the so-called ultra-Orthodox institutions, I would say, Ein yiras elokim ba bamakom hazeh. There is no fear of God in this place. They have Torah. Sometimes the Torah is on a very high level. They have their journals and their different Torah and their dinners and all kinds of very nice exterior Jewish trappings. But one critical ingredient that they're missing is fear of God. I did not get to get the sense when I was in YU and Maya Angelou was invited there and Bibi was invited there and Kfira was taught in the philosophy class and these flippant uh, dating lectures were given and, and you know all these crazy things where the Madoff money, all these weird things that were happening, I never got a sense that there was a fear of God there. There was Torah there, there were prominent Torah personalities there, but there was no fear of God. I don't think that the institutions, YU, OU, all the institutions that you see associated with the vaccines, I don't see fear of God. I'm not the biggest Talmud Chacham in the world. I got a smicha that I barely got. Again, I don't really think of myself as a rabbi. I'm just a school teacher, but I do fear Hashem. I fear God. And I think people who fear God will approach things differently than other people. People who fear God, when they hear BB giving a speech, are not just gonna jump up and cheer because he's a famous person and he's close to power and everybody else is standing up and cheering. They'll think to themselves first, is this what Hashem wants me to do? Does this fit with the Torah that I know and understand? It has to pass the smell test for me. Not just I ask the rabbi and the rabbi says, do it, but it needs to pass my test as well. I'm a God-fearing person. Does this fit with my fear of God? And I don't think that's what's going on at YU. I think that the culture of YU is that the Torah will give in to the secular society. We, we will twist the Torah, we will make it work. So the vaccines come from the secular society, the, the, the philosophy, the kavo, the dirty money, that all comes from non-Torah and anti-Torah sources. The Torah will always bend and give in and stand up and cheer for the uni, university as opposed to the university giving way for the Torah. And, and what do the students and the parents say? Whatever, that's just the way it is. The scandals at YU, the scandals all over the place, you know, all kinds of scandals going on. That's the way it is. The problem is that YU is also a feeder, right? YU has re rabbinic placement. There are many, many shuls all, all over the world that will only get rabbis through YU's placement office. So if you're a rabbi and you want a job, especially if you want a good job and you want to climb the ladder and get a high paying job as well, so you can also earn a six figure salary and feel like, 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 like a big shot and rub shoulders with rich and powerful people, you need generally to go through the placement office. So you know the students are going to play the game. They're going to do what they've been taught to do, which is to look the other way when bad things are going on, not speak out. And that's why I am, as far as I know, I'd like to find out that there are exceptions. As far as I know, I am the only uh, y, y, student of YU who has smicha from, 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 from REITs 
to speak out about the vaccines because I was never part of the establishment. I don't want their money. I don't want their kavod. I always looked at it from God's perspective. What does God want us to do? But the people that are playing the game and want to climb the ladder have this culture of just follow your orders and do what you're told. You're being paid and don't make a big stink out of anything. And that's why they don't have a history of going against the establishment about anything. When it comes to the gay parades, they have nothing to say about it. When it comes to the gender identity nonsense, they have nothing to say. When it comes to abortions, millions of babies being killed, when was the last time a YU rabbi protested any of this? Because it goes against the Western American culture that they worship. So either they mutedly will, will say something just to be Yotze, or they'll just look the other way and say nothing at all. Now, I, why did I want to talk about this now? Because something, something broke last week. There was a story in the commentator that I saw uh, about... A, a girl from Stern College, which is a sister school to YU, this is a school for girls, who uh, an, 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 an anonymously claimed that she, she was raped. There was, a, there was a long article in the commentator about it. You can find it on their website. It's called, I Thought Rape Culture Didn't Exist at YU Until I Was Raped. It was published on August 25th. And the editor said that normally the commentator would not publish articles without the person's name, but because this is a special case, they, they decided to allow the author to publish it uh, an, an, an anonymously. And of course, I wasn't there, you weren't there, we don't know what goes on behind closed doors. And unfortunately, there are many women today who make up stories for various reasons. So I don't know what happened and I'm not gonna get into the game of who's right and who's wrong and should the girl have been there anyway and who's guilty and who are we blaming? That's not the main point of the story, okay? It seems quite possible that a girl from Stern was raped by a, a, a student at YU. At least it's quite possible. Now the student went to the, to the YU office for help after some time, okay? And the first thing they did was they made her sign a non-disclosure agreement, which is a very strange thing to do. And again, I'm not a lawyer. I don't know all the legalistic process of, of everything. But if a girl came to me and I was an administrator at YU, my first reaction would not be call the lawyer, get her to sign this paper, a non-disclosure agreement. Now, again, I don't know what I would do. I'm not trained in that area, but that would not be the first thing I do. I wouldn't say before we can make an effort to help you, please sign this paper that you're not going to talk, which shows that why you cares more about its reputation and its PR than the human being standing before them who needs help. Now, maybe why you couldn't help her. I mean, the ultimate conclusion of the thing after the three months, uh, why you looking into it, they said, look, we don't know. We can't really do anything about it. And that might be true. Again, we weren't in the room. Who do you know? How do you know who to trust? It's not necessarily why use job to deal with this. It's really something for law enforcement. Be all that as it may, I want to focus on the reaction of why you making the girl sign a non -dis -dis disclosure agreement. And after the article, a day after this came out in the commentator, why you issued a statement, which you can find on their website. I will read the statement in full. Yeshiva University is dedicated to engaging everyone with respect and dignity while providing a safe and secure environment for our students, faculty, and the entire YU community. To this end, we have extensive policies and procedures in place required by Title IX to address allegations of sexual misconduct in which all complaints are investigated fully and comprehensively. YU also conducts annual harassment and misconduct training for staff and students. While the law very clearly restricts what we are allowed to share to protect the parties involved, we treat this and all allegations in a caring, sensitive, and compassionate manner. As is our standard practice in sexual misconduct complaints, we immediately retained independent investigators to conduct a comprehensive inquiry into the allegations and a final determination was made based on a full evaluation of all available information. Blah, 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 blah. Legalistic mumbo jumbo nonsense. There's no name attributed to this. There's no person that you can talk to or ask questions to. This is like when, when there are allegations of the, of, of the, of the uh, police in Israel uh, abusing someone, beating the hell out of somebody for no reason, and there's, a, there's, a, there's an outcry. So, they, so the Israel police will issue a statement, we take these allegations seriously and we'll do a full investigation and we, you know, that sort of thing. This corporate nonsense mumbo jumbo that means nothing, a lot of passive statements, no name behind it, nobody taking responsibility. And therefore, if you question anybody at the institution, they will point at the statement and say, look, it's not me, I'm not authorized to speak about this, but here's the statement and something is being done. We are looking at it and taking it seriously and that's all, it's just a way for them to cover for themselves and hide for themselves, no compassion, no soul, no, no human being stating this, just a, just a bunch of people in empty suits, corporate lawyers, high-powered lawyers and PR people getting together in a room and say, how can we wiggle out of this and make it seem like we're doing something where we're doing nothing? Basically, Jen Psaki could have written this. It goes on. Based on the advice of outside legal counsel, 
Prior to delivery of the report, an NDA was signed by the parties in order to protect the confidentiality of the investigation and the integrity of the process. Now, there was an outcry about this, so it continues and says, the NDA did not in any way restrict any party from speaking about the incident or their experience. Well, huh, that's kind of strange. You're signing a non-disclosure agreement that says you're not allowed to talk about it, but you're not restricted from speaking about it or your experience. Well, that's kind of weird. Again, I'm not, I'm not a lawyer. So maybe there's some things they can talk about or can't talk about. Shouldn't that be clarified? So basically saying, yeah, we forced this girl to sign an NDA, but don't worry, she could say whatever she wants. That's what that's the message that seems to be being put out over here. And then finally, it concludes, in addition, at the beginning and throughout the process, the university informs all complainants that they can go to the police with the full support of the university. Thank you very much. Now, again, I don't know if this girl was raped or not. I don't know who's most to blame, less to blame. Not really the point. The point is that this is a cold, soulless, godless reaction. We are complying with Title IX. We're complying with our legal responsibilities. We're going to investigate. We'll do everything that we're technically required to do. Where is your soul? You are a yeshiva. You are a Torah institution. Are the Russia yeshiva going to give a long muster schmooze on Thursday night about girls being raped or possibly being raped? or being forced to sign NDAs, or what's going on? What the hell is going on at YU? Are they gonna give a muster schmooze about that? I highly doubt it. What word have they said about it? Are they gonna publish articles in the Jewish press and give rulings about this? No, they're not gonna say a word because that's their marching orders. Keep your head down, push people to take vaccines and te teach the next year and ca cash, cash those checks. That unfortunately is the culture at YU. And I will say it could very well be, and I'll say this somewhat snarkily, but maybe the student who, if he did rape this girl, was simply following the psak of Rabbi Schechter that people should be injected with things that they don't really want. I mean, maybe he's just a good student of Rabbi Schechter. So, I mean, I, there's a lot going on at YU. And again, I'm not only picking on YU. This is something that bleeds into the entire Orthodox world because the rabbis who come from YU, and all these rabbis from the five towns, most of these people went through the YU system and they're putting out these government sponsored videos. Get the vaccine now, 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 now. They work for the government. They're getting paid. They're being bribed. You have Aaron Glotz, who essentially was responsible for, for the death of a woman because he refused to give her ivermectin against doctor's orders and against court orders and against the fact that she was improving. I just wrote about this yesterday. Why you has nothing to say about this and it bleeds into the Jewish media. The Jewish press will only publish propaganda for the vaccines. All the Jewish media, they're publishing propaganda for the vaccine. So they're all bought out. They're all part of the same system. Where is the Yiras Hashem? Where is the, where is the fear of God to really do what the Torah says? You do what the Torah says, you, you, you show that you fear God when you have something to lose by doing it, when it's inconvenient, when you might lose your job, when you might get yourself into hot water. That's when you show that you really fear Hashem, when you're most or nefesh, when you're willing to give something up. When was the last time somebody from the Orthodox world, the YU world, the Five Towns world, the Baltimore world, when, when was the last time one of these prominent rabbis was willing to give something up because he had a conscience and he had fear of Hashem. That's the question that I'm gonna leave everybody with. And just the final point I'm gonna make is that every single person has a responsibility to do something about this. We can't just say, well, whatever, that's the way it is. You know, bad things happen. Overall, it's pretty good. You just gotta go along with it. You don't have to go along with it. I was never really part of the system. I never wanted to be part of the system. And thank God I wasn't because I wouldn't have a clear head today about the vaccines and all these other issues if I was just another guy going through the system, trying, trying, trying to get a, you know, a BA, an MA, smicha, a good job, climb the ladder, get his home, have a couple of kids, live in the five towns or T-neck and just go through life like that as, as a brainless drone who's just trying to fit in. Thank God I don't fit in. I don't want to fit in. I want to be a person who fears Hashem and thinks for himself first and foremost. So that's what we should be teaching our children. And if an institution is not teaching fear of Hashem above all else, and if the people who are running the institution are not willing to give up something that is important to them for the sake of Hashem and the Torah, we should not support those institutions. Maybe we need to take over the institutions and clean them out and put in new people, or maybe we need to just start new institutions, or maybe we need to give up the institutions altogether and just do things on a very local level just families getting together and hiring teachers on their own, you know, having more personal direct control over what people are being taught. But that's something that people need to figure out for themselves. Right now, we just have to stop supporting the institutions. That's all I have to say. If there are any questions, I'll be happy to address them. Um, I don't see, okay. Have you heard from anyone you knew at YU about your activism? Well, yeah, I mean, uh, I get emails from all kinds of people. 
uh, I would say the typical why you people, I am Prasanna non grata with them when I've gone to in, in Israel, sort of why you type minyanim and I'm not wearing my mask. Uh, I get a lot of abuse from those. I stopped going to those minyanim and I would stand there very proudly with my bare face exposed, shooting Delta all over the place, murdering people right and left. And, uh, and that's what I do. The why you people, they're all taking the vaccine. You know, these are the rational people who are always making fun of the Jews who follow Das Torah, which is problematic in its own right. Das Torah is a form of idolatry. We are supposed to listen to rabbis, but we're not supposed to just blindly follow what somebody says because he's an authority figure. So the YU types are always making fun of these people who just follow Das Torah and blindly do what they're told. They are the greatest sheep of all. These are the people that are lining up more than anybody else to be those good American Jews or those good Zionist Israelis to just follow their rabbis, follow their leaders, follow their doctors and get injected. So those people can't stand me. They hate my guts uh, at this point. And it's fine. I, people can like me or dislike me, but that's generally the feedback I've gotten. I've gotten more sort of like private feedback here and there, really special people who do agree with me and are fighting the good fight as well. There are those as well. But I would say the so-called mainstream average YU type uh, can't stand me anymore. Absolutely can't stand me. And that's fine. That's, that's their choice. Uh, are there any other questions? Any idea what J. David Black says about all this COVID stuff? No, I haven't heard him speak about it, so I can't help you there. Any other questions? There are no questions, and I will wish everybody a Shana Tova, and thank you for joining us. We will probably not have another session for a couple of weeks at least because of the Yamim Tovim that are coming. Maybe we'll schedule another uh, emergency one for a different day if necessary, but as of now, we don't have anything planned until after the Yamim Tovim, so everybody, please have a Please daven well. Uh, this is really a time when uh, Hashem is close to us. There are all these incredible things happening. This is a time to really have Yiras, Yiras Hashem, get close to Hashem. Daven, get close to your fellow Jew. Wake people up if you can, but if you can't, just focus on yourself and those close to you. Have a Shana Tova, and I expect really big, great things to happen in the coming year. So signing off, and have a good night.